You are listening to the Spot Podcast, Adventures with the Trendsetter. I am your host, Brian Berg. I thank you guys so much for listening to this episode. Really appreciate it. We have adult film star Ricky Johnson here on the show. If you guys don't know who Ricky Johnson is, well, he's been about two years in the business, one of the hottest new male performers in the industry, taking it by storm. If you guys want to find out all about him, you can follow him on Twitter and Instagram at Year of the Ricky, all one word. He also has Tumblr, OnlyFans, and premium Snapchat. So guys, definitely check that out if you want to know more about this amazing male performer, this, this cool, laid-back, relaxed, chill individual uh, that we had on the show too. So guys, we really appreciate you guys enjoying the adventures with the trend center. But you also support what I do. With my tag team partner, Jeff Martin, on the High Spot Podcast. We talk about everything in the world, especially the world of professional wrestling. Then you can follow us on Twitter, Instagram, Snapchat, one word, at High Spot Podcast. You can also listen to the show on Apple Podcast, iTunes as well. Leave a five-star rating. Leave a review. It only takes a few seconds, guys. You can also check out the show on SoundCloud, TuneIn, Google Play, Stitcher, and Podbean. We're also part of some great networks as well, some great content in there if you guys want to listen to it. Cheap Pops Podcast Network, B Plus Player Radio, and the Shining Wizards Network as well. We also have a YouTube channel out, guys. It's it's probably three months old, or maybe more than three months old, and it's got a huge amount of subscribers giving us likes, giving us a subscribe button, hitting that button, and being a part of the crew, which you guys can be as well. If you just go to YouTube and type in High Spot Podcast, you'll see all exclusive interviews of Adventures with the Translator with myself when I cover all the world of the adult film industry, my time at Exotica, ABN, and here interviewing uh, – People and individuals like Ricky Johnson, which uh, I have, think, two companies and two PRs, specifically Star Factory PR and The Rub PR as well, to make this all happen. And you can also watch exclusive content of stuff that Jeff and I have done when we've you know, interviewed the who's who of professional wrestling. And you can just see it exclusively on our YouTube channel. We've interviewed former tag team champs. Impact Wrestling LAX, we've interviewed Alberto El Petron, Sienna the Savage, Bull Club members, the villain Marty Skrull, Adam, you can poke an eye out with that thing, Hangman Page, Jay Lethal, Josh Woods, also our time at WrestleCon in New Orleans, Louisiana for WrestleMania weekend, as well as our interviews from Ring of Honor Supercard during that whole time. It's exciting. You guys can catch that on our YouTube channel as well. So, guys, without further ado, here he is on the High Spot Podcast, Ricky Johnson, talking about the world of the adult film industry. All right, we're back here on the High Spot Podcast, Adventures of the Trendsetter, with adult film star Ricky Johnson. Ricky, graciously giving us a few minutes of his time. Ricky, thank you so much for coming to the show. First and foremost, how you doing, man? I'm doing pretty good. I just got in a car accident, like, probably an hour ago. It wasn't that bad, but this lady rear-ended me. It's pretty interesting. Really? And you seem to be so calm, have such a calm demeanor about it. For me, I'd be stressed out and upset right now. How, how are you holding no, it no. together? I had a rental, and I, and I was a little stressed out, but I went to the Enterprise immediately, and I found out that I got the coverage for it. So I was pretty happy. Oh, thank God. I always take a risk every time I rent a car, and they say, do you want the insurance? And I'm thinking, what's the likelihood of this is going to happen to me? You know, I, I do the same thing. I, I always say, no, I'm good. But this time, I was like, eh, why not? And then, thank goodness I did. Uh, God bless you for that. Your luck's a lot better than mine because every single time I get it, I'm like, I'm just wasting money. And I know the one time I don't, that same thing's going to happen to you. What happen, it's it's going to happen to me. What happened to you? So it's, Yeah, the one time you don't is the one time it's going gonna, it's gonna to nip you in the butt. Exactly. But, uh, well, thankfully, you weren't hurt. Everything was fine. It's taken care of. But, again, that's the last thing you want to do, especially when you're coming here on Adventures to the Trend Center. So I greatly appreciate you uh, keeping <laughs> it even keel, especially. But, um, you know, something I want to ask you, man. Uh, I had Ryan Drill on the show not too long ago, and I kind of asked him a similar question. You, you probably get asked it a lot. And don't worry, I'm not going to ask you how you get into the business. But I want to ask you about your 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 ability to transition from – what you're normally doing in high school and going into the adult film industry after school. Um, yours is a little different story than Ryan. When I spoke to Ryan, he said he had to go through all this research. I'm sure you did as well. And to send his, his photos and his resumes to all these different agencies until he heard something back. It seems like everything worked itself out for you. So now that you're in the industry more than over two years, I believe you're in the industry. Is it all you expected, expected it to be or uh, were you not expecting anything when you, when you dived into it? Uh, no, it's pretty much what I expected it to be. It's a lot more fun than I thought it would be. And, like, I, I, I like it a lot more than I thought I would like it. I thought, because I, I got in performing and I wanted to get behind the camera immediately whenever I could. But I, I really like performing. And I still plan on getting behind the camera, but I just want to get everything I can out of performing 
be the most I can be. So I think like two, three more years of performing, and then I'm gonna like solely focus on being behind the camera. Well, talking about performing, man, you seem to be like uh, they gave me some stuff about you and all the stuff that's coming out that you're in uh, and you're working basically every other day. And it must be, you know, hey, you're doing something you enjoy, you're doing something you love. So, you know, that's always a good thing. But uh, in, in the terms of the male performers, it's a, is it kind of similar more towards the female performers? Because when I ask them about, you know, longevity and pacing themselves, they're very particular in what they do and the time in which they do it, whether it be for personal choice or whether it be professional choice. For a male standpoint. For, for for girls it's different. For guys, there's like such a longer longevity. Yeah. You can practically perform until your dick stops working. You know, because you can go from like the teenage role to the 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 father role to the grandpa role, honestly. Yeah. So. I mean, was that the mindset you took in that I'm gonna get as much work as I possibly can so I can build my name and build my brand, basically? Yeah. It's for me it's all about building my brand and my name and just whenever you think of Ricky Johnson, hopefully you think of like, Oh, this is a really solid, really good performer. No, yeah, definitely. I mean, and it's uh, another thing too that uh, you know I try at least because I've been I've been doing at I've been going at this whole interview process and podcasting since I've been working in radio for about seven years now. Uh, do you ever have time to sit back and reflect, or is it still too early for you to kind of reflect on everything because you're just still on the go trying to get as much work as you possibly can? Because honestly, when I'm looking at the stuff you've done from an outsider's perspective, obviously an admirer of what you guys do as an industry. It's quite a lot of stuff you've done in the span of two years. Has it felt that long? And do you have time to kind of sit back and be like, wow, I've done a lot in two years? Well, for me, the time flies because, like, I, there's still so much I want to do. And I don't really feel like I've accomplished as much as I, I possibly can. So I just – I haven't had time to reflect because I don't really think I've accomplished as much as I as I can. So when I, whenever I'm like, oh, okay, yeah, let me set, if I settle down or, like, take off, like, a month or two months, then I'll definitely, like, reflect and just think back on the other stuff. With that being said, uh, something I can kind of relate to you, I kind of feel the same way about stuff that I do too, that I'm always looking to the next thing and not really worrying so much about now because I feel like there's so much for me at least to accomplish. Do you uh, ever, are you your worst critic basically is what I want to ask you? Oh, definitely, yeah. I look at all my scenes and critique myself and to see what I can do better. Is there anything particular that you're looking at in terms of like your angle, your performance, your uh, uh, what, your stamina, stuff like that? Or is there more of just like yeah, – Yeah, also like my stamina, my performance, if I do something like something goofy. Sometimes I might like even like put my scene on Snapchat. Like not the whole scene but just like moments like look look at me uh, fumbling to take off my clothes. But people like that because it's natural. But it's just like I'm a, I'm a big critic critique of myself so – no, no, yeah, as we all are, you know, it's definitely understandable, man. But uh, you know, speaking of that, in terms of putting stuff on your Snapchat and using social media and things of that nature, I mean, you're using that to an extent to not only get your name out there, but to engage in a lot of supporters and and people that are fans of yours and fan of your of your work. So when you do go to these conventions, like for example, AVN Exotica, which is going to be in Chicago not too long, and then you have Miami and Edison, New Jersey. Um, What's the feeling like from the performer standpoint? I always find that pretty interesting. I mean, I can only imagine people come up to me sometimes and tell me they listen to the show. I kind of take a step back, like, wow, you're really listening to it? I appreciate it. What's it like for you as a performer when people come up to you and show their appreciation for your work? It's kind of the same thing because I I look at it from, like, this is, like, going on. I'm going on my third year soon, and, like, my first year and the difference between my first and second year and, like, the amount of people that notice me and, like, come up to me and say hi and say, hey, you're doing a great job makes me feel good about the stuff I'm done. Like, oh, man, like, you know, it motivates me to keep going. Like, people like my work and stuff like that. No, that's great, man. I mean, and your work, like I said, has been a massive amount, which you're keeping yourself busy for. But uh, at the same time, it hasn't been unrecognized by your industry and your peers because you've won several awards and been nominated for a lot of several awards, too. When it comes to the award season, I'm always interested in it. For example, I always like to have a pat on the back sometimes, but I really don't feel I need for validation. In your sense, to get these awards, I know you're looking forward to January of 2019 – for XBiz and AVN wanting to win Male Performer of the Year. That's a great prestigious award, especially in your profession with all the male talent that's out there. Is it a sense of validation for you when you do get those awards and you win in those nominations? Or is it more of just like it's nice to know that your peers or people around you respect your work? I, it's more so I, I, it's, I, it's nice that people respect my work. Like I, I'm more excited for the nomination to be like considered one of the top and just consistently one of the top. So it's a good feeling, you know. Ricky, where do you get your work ethic from? Because something I've noticed from a lot of people in the industry that I've, I've had the uh, pleasure of interviewing and talking to, especially I'm always interested in talking to the male talent, where's that drive and determination come from when you're working as much as you are right now? 
I think it's because I used to run track in college. So it's kind of like I have that like work ethic mentality from track because it was instilled in all the weight room days of going to practice <laughs> at six in the morning or never being late. Coach you know? yelling so at ESA, like, come on, go, go, keep going. Yeah, so I was coached a lot for at least like six years before I joined porn. So it's just I brought that mentality into porn. You think that benefits you being coached? Because I know a lot of people, for example, whether I mean, let's take this out of the adult film industry for a second. They're they're going to be an actor. Or they're going to. I mean, you guys are actors too, but they're doing something they've never been coached in their life. So when they they're given direction, they didn't know how to handle it. Do you think being coached the way you were in track has benefited you? That when directors say we want this and that, you can kind of put it together pretty quickly. Oh, 100 percent. I think that just knowing what was was something what somebody wants from you is like a really good like attribute to have. Because like you said, people might never get direction before and they're told to do something and they might not take it the right way. And just like it causes more issues. There's so many genres in the adult film industry, which I'm so like uh, still fascinated. The fact that it seems like it's a huge plethora that never ends in terms of genres. But something that I always find pretty interesting when I've uh, watched uh, uh, scenes is that, for example, when the male has to do the point of view where you're basically just laying in an uncomfortable position, whether you're laying on your back, you're standing up, and the camera's right on top of you. How difficult, is it a difficult mindset for, for speaking for yourself, you can't speak for others, to stay in that mindset and that zone that you need to be in, knowing that there's somebody right next to you, so it's not as natural, it's not the natural feeling in terms of you're alone with somebody else? It's not a natural feeling, but you get used to it, and you know at the end of the day you guys are have one goal. You know, It's not like, his goal is to make you uncomfortable or the director's goal is to make you uncomfortable. They're just trying to get a really nice shot that other people can appreciate and see. And when you see that, it's just you all want the same thing, you know. They're not trying to make you uncomfortable. Then you, you won't feel uncomfortable. But I do say uh, being in shape is important because I, I stop working out and then sometimes holding positions, you know, you start to feel it. So it's, it's really important to stay in shape. Well, there's no question, man. You, you stay in tremendous shape right now. I'm jealous. I've been trying my ass off. I still can't get a six-pack, let alone a two-pack. And you're walking around with your shirt off. I'm like, this, this son of a bitch. You know what I'm saying to myself? <laughs> just that, that goes with anybody, especially when people walk down the beach and you've been busting your butt in the gym. And then you see them in the gym for like five minutes. And I'm like, oh, you got to be kidding me. And this guy looks like this. But uh, speaking of your training, uh, what type of training – how has it evolved? I mean because, for example, there's one thing about training with weights and stuff like that. Uh, before you got into it, and now that you're into it now, is there a different type of training, or you just continually do the same thing you, you've been doing? More so, I just try to eat healthier, because uh, when I was in college, I, I worked out a lot, but didn't eat that healthy, but I was able to over, overcompensate because I worked out a lot. Now I don't work out as much, so I try to eat healthier, so I don't have to work out as much. So it's just eating healthy, and then when I can, I just run and keep my mileage up. I run like one or two miles a day if I can. Do a lot of stretching as well? Because I imagine holding those awkward positions must be a lot of strain in your muscles. Do a lot of yoga, stuff like that to remain flexible? Yeah, I used to do yoga. I need to get back into yoga. I found the yoga spot right next to my house I'm going to get a membership for. Uh, is it hot yoga? or? Uh, no, but I've done hot yoga, and it's intense. I was sweating more than I've ever sweated my whole life. Oh, it's got to stink up in there, man, seriously. <laughs> <laughs> It's sticky. It's very sticky. It's sticky and stinky too, probably, depending on if yeah. you showered. But uh, no. depending on who's in there, yeah. Yeah, it's depending who's in there exactly, and what time of day, basically. If it's rush hour, then forget about it. I'm not. I'm not doing that class at all. But uh -huh. um, uh, with all the stuff that you're, I mean, you're on Twitter, you're on uh, Instagram, Tumblr, OnlyFans. You have a premium Snapchat where, where everybody that wants to follow you and, and get to know you more can follow you. Uh, two question here. Uh, when it comes to the fact that, I mean, really think about this, I, when I think about the adult film industry, maybe 10, 15 years ago, none of this stuff was available. So people really had to go old school. If you want to send, a, for example, if I want to send you a letter and try to do an interview here, I had to kind of write you a letter. How archaic is that? Buy a stamp, mail it to a P.O. box. Hopefully you get it and send them a response back. Now with social media, do you find it now in terms of social media is so much more uh, easier to gain access to your to your fans and also easier for you to be able to market and promote yourself the way you want to. Yeah, 100%. I think I, the great thing about social media is that you can like show who you are, like the same thing how it goes for like celebrities and actors and, and sports uh, athletes and, and things like that is because like you get to see how they are as a person. If you like that person, then it's like an even plus, you know? Like if you're a fan of LeBron James and then you go on his Twitter and you're like, oh, man, this guy is also funny. Like, you know, he's a great athlete, and I can relate to this person. So it brings more of, like, an intimate setting to, like, being a fan or liking somebody. 
Speaking of LeBron James, you've been watching the NBA uh, playoffs recently? Yeah, I have. I'm a fan of LeBron, and I still think they're going to come away with uh, the win. All right, I got to ask you this. For this series, not for the next one. Okay, I got you. But I got to ask you this question because everybody gets asked. I'm sure you've been in debates with your friends about it as well. I talk about it with uh, my my co-host here, Jeff Martin, where we're doing our show, The High Spot Podcast. This whole comparison with him and Michael Jordan, are, are you sick and tired of listening to it as much as I am sometimes? Yeah, but it's going to happen for a while because LeBron still has at least like three more really good years in him, so they're going to keep comparing and comparing. Well, what's your mindset on it? If we're comparing Michael Jordan and LeBron James, which side do you favor? Uh, I think at the very end, when it's all said and done, people are going to look back and say that LeBron was better than Michael Jordan. If LeBron retired right now, I don't think so. But I think after like, because LeBron's going to just have more and more stats and stats. And Mm -hmm. his thing is he's longevity. He doesn't get injured. So if he has like four or five more years, he's gonna host. He's gonna be like Tom Brady and have every single record there is. So if you look back on it, you're gonna be like, "Yo, this guy was number one points, number one rebounds, like number four in assist, and you know he has like three rings. He's been to the finals nine times." You're gonna say, oh, "Yeah, maybe he was the best." And everybody who saw Jordan might be dead. So a lot of comparisons. <laughs> Come on, man! I'm still alive. What are you talking about, dude? Come on! I'm not dead yet. I'm still breathing. Not dude, yet. Dude. Not yet. Yeah. Not yet. Exactly. Come on! I got a few more years left in me, at least. But uh, <laughs> hopefully. But uh, no, I just always find it interesting, you know, because it's like I feel like this debate can go back and forth. I could debate you for 25 minutes about this stuff, right? But at the same yeah. time, it, it's a pointless debate, you know, why? Because it's just different eras. I mean, a lot yeah, of people no, could say honestly, if Michael if game. Michael Jordan was playing in this era where LeBron James is going, there's no doubt in my mind he'd be doing 50 points a game, every single game, just because nobody can touch him. Put LeBron in the era back of Jordan back in the 1990s where a lot, it was a lot more physical. Uh, it's it's it'd be interesting. I would love to see if it was somehow physically possible with all the technology we have to be able to do that. That would be awesome. But it's it's a debate that's gonna end up nowhere because at the end of the day, people who are fans of Michael Jordan are gonna love Michael. Uh, people who are fans now of this new generation of basketball are gonna love LeBron James. So there's no winning, right? Yeah, there's no, there's none. Ah, oh, God. So we're gonna have to deal but with this. But the thing the is, it's like <laughs> it's like comparing the porn star from 1930s or 1950s. To one now, like the top one then, the top one now. It's a different era. Have you met yeah, any of those people thing. in that era? Where they're like, well, back in my day type of thing. No, I mean, I know Shawn Michaels and Lexington are still really, really cool guys. I know they're very dominant in their in their prime stage of their career. I have a whole amount of respect for that, too. I mean, I, I don't like to say what you guys do is easy, but like we just talked about social media. It's like nowadays you can really go out there and promote yourself and reach a whole bunch of people. I mean, back then... I mean, unless you were a die hardcore fan, uh, you really had to really work at it to get your name out there, right? Yeah, yeah. No, to be like a really top guy back then, you have to like be a really top guy and just word of mouth, like, yo, have you heard, have you seen that guy? Yo, the guy's amazing. So it's like, you know, they really were amazing people. Let me ask you a question about this. Like, for me, when I had a chance at AVN to interview a couple male talent there, I always kind of rolled around the same question. I think it's valid. You know why? Because let's be honest, man. When you're in any type of business, right, there always is some type of competition. I mean, I'm not saying you're yeah. trying to knock other people out of the way. You're only focusing on yourself, which I've heard a lot of, and I'm sure you feel the same way. But I'll ask you anyway. Are you in competition with other guys or more in competition with yourself? I feel like I'm more in competition with myself because, like, I don't – not that I don't see competition, but it's just, like, I, I – if someone's better than me or the director thinks they're better than me, then, then hey, then that's what it is. But if I'm my best person, there's nothing I can do but just be better, you know? So it's just like if I focus on being the best person I can be, mm-hmm. I don't see any problem with any outcome. Does it really depend on your part, man, when you're, when you're starting out, right, and you get signed with an agency like you did, right, and then you haven't done a scene ever? I mean, you probably had sex before, but you've never done it on camera. So, and then they put you in a scene – and they say, all right, here you go, perform. And, you know, the conversation I had with Ryan was more of it's kind of like a test performance. You have one or two chances to kind of prove to them that you can be dependable and reliable. Uh, if from your mindset, is it really just rebooking yourself and constantly proving to directors and, and production companies that you can be a dependable performer that starts making you go up there to work with the high echelon elite performers in the female department? Yeah, I mean, I think that's how it starts because – you got to look at it as you're a new guy and this company has a rotation of like five guys they always use. Yeah, I noticed and that too. Like the same guys are always being used, granted, because the females like working with them. They trust them. They know they're going to do a good job. But how somebody like you like kind of not cut the line but get in that line? You have you just have to do word of mouth. Honestly, for me, what helped me was oh, some female talent requested me 
And so, so some directors gave me an opportunity. I was like, hey, we heard that this girl wants to work with you. So we're going to give you an opportunity. And so there's my opportunity. And either I uh, do a good job or don't. So luckily I was able to do a good job. How's the interaction like there initially? Because, again, you don't know this person. You, you, know, you don't know them from, like, a, a person stranger to me at the bar, right? Granted, they've been tested. They're clean. You know that much. But when you when you, you first meet the person you're working with, uh, I guess it depends on the talent, right? Is it more of, hi, my name is Ricky, how are you, conversating to kind of get to know each other? Or is it more like, hello, introduce yourself, be respectful, and then kind of separate until it's time to actually do it? Well, I mean, it, it depends on uh, what company I'm working for and what rules they abide by in terms of if you're able to talk to a talent before the scene or not. But most of the time, like now, I know most of the girls, so like I have a little bit of chemistry with by knowing knowing them ahead of time, but you say hi, you just get a vibe from them as much as you can, mm -hmm. and just go out there and do your job. Because most of the time, the girl's really pretty, or she has an amazing personality, or there's something you can go off and focus on to have a good scene. The comment I always made too with female talent, and I also did this with male talent at the conventions that I went to, is that you know the females are the picture, you guys are the frame. You guys are there to make the women look even better than the, what they really are. So when it comes to um, chemistry on a scene it's different for women than maybe men what develops chemistry in your mind what, what what at what point when you're starting to do the production do you feel like wow this is going to be good or man this is going to be a lot of work yeah see there's there's like three factors for me mm -hmm. if the person has a nice personality if the person looks good and if the person is a great performer in general and so if you have at least one of those, then no matter what, it's going to be a, like amazing time. We'll have a good time. But if you have like none of those three, then it'll, it'll be a work day and we'll still get it done. Yeah, I'd also think like if you're at, if you really show – it's like for example for me, like going to the strip club, right? If you're the strip club and you're with these gorgeous women but they have that look on their face like they don't, they don't want to be here, why am I going to get a dance from you? Yeah, I've been to the strip club uh, uh, twice. Mm-hmm. And the first time I went, I can tell the girl didn't want to be there. And I was like, oh, man, yeah, this is uncomfortable. Yeah, so I can and imagine. the second time, you can tell the girl is having fun stripping. So it's, just like, it's a different experience when, you, like, the person doesn't want to be there as opposed to, like, I want to be here. No, yeah, exactly. I assume, too, if you meet somebody you're going to do a scene with and they have that look on their face, like, I really don't want to be here. Granted, it may not be about you, but she doesn't really want to. This could be, like, more extra work for you, basically, right? Yeah, 100%. Yeah. Oh, man. But, uh, you know, Ricky, uh, talking about, you know, you, what you do to unwind, one thing you do to unwind is obviously you're playing video games, which is cool. What other things do you use to kind of unwind and, and kind of relax? Uh, because sometimes it's very easy to get lost in your work. I know that firsthand. So besides, you know, playing video games, what else do you do to uh, allow yourself to kind of unwind and refresh the batteries? Uh, just hang out with my friends. Mm -hmm. And because I have a friend in the industry, Abella Danger and uh, Gina Valentina. And they're really cool people, just like, you know, chill and just be ourselves when we're not on set, hang around, get some food, laugh. So it's really good to just be, be your, your non-porn name for a little bit. Do you find that funny, too? Because, for example, us on Ice About Podcast, we also talk about professional wrestling. I don't know if you've, you've watched professional wrestling or do you follow it oh, now. I love WWE. I haven't seen it recently, but growing up, it was all about Triple H, Stone Cold Steve Austin, Kurt Angle, and all of them. Oh, yeah? So, so there, that you were during, like, the Attitude Era, basically, kind of in a way. Yeah. Or post-Attitude Era. So, that's nah, yeah. cool. Have you been to live events? Did Not the, yet. Raw Not and SmackDown? Yet. No, I, I know about them, though. I, I used to like The Rock before he was Dwayne Johnson. Yeah, exactly, right? And then that's the thing, too. Like, he's The Rock. I'm sure when he's down there, they're saying Rock or calling him Dwayne. So, for example, when you're hanging out with Abella Danger and, and Gina Valentina, was her name? Yeah, Gina Valentina. Yeah, when you're hanging out with them, is it like, are you calling yourselves your, your stage names or are you calling yourselves your real names? No, we call ourselves each other's our real names because we're just being ourselves, you know? Okay, is it kind of awkward sometimes? Do you get just used to using the name Ricky Johnson? So when somebody says, hey, Ricky Johnson, to turn around, and but if somebody calls you on the street your real name, is that kind of awkward for you? Like, hey, you, you don't know me. Yeah, because I, I hear Ricky more than I hear anything. So I know. When I, do, when I do hear my real name nowadays, I'm like, whoa, how do you know my real name? How do you know me? You know, I automatically feel like you know me because you know my real name. It's like, whoa, you know me. So. Exactly. So I think it's always kind of funny because you ask certain professional wrestlers and they're like, so what would you like to – for example, I interview some of them. I know their real name just because either you get that on the internet or you've just kind of known them in passing. And when I say, do you want me to call you your real name? Like, nah, just just use my wrestling name. I'm I'm, I'm so used to that by now. I, don't, I rarely answer to my real name. So I was, I was kind of find that as a fun dynamic there where people are so used to their stage name rather than their actual real name. 
No, yeah, hundred percent. I'm I'm way used to my stage name now. Like, I don't ever hear my my real name. But no, talk about professional wrestling. You know, I always find it very similar in, in both ends because, for example, when you look at pro wrestling, you see like the grind they put on their bodies, the traveling schedules they have, and things of that nature. Do you find some comparisons with the fact that it's kind of similar to the Dell film industry? Because I know most of these, for example, I've seen some of these uh, these females at Feature Dancing, they're living out of a suitcase. Is that kind of a hectic lifestyle for you as well? Or do you now, granted, there's still so much more you want to do, of course, and accomplish, but do you feel now you're able to kind of dictate your scheduling rather than just taking whatever's available for you? Yeah, no, I, I feel like in the last, like, probably – six seven months I, I developed a way to where i can dictate my schedule and pretty much perform in the scenes that i know that i'm going to have a great time in and with the right directors and stuff like that because there's a lot of directors and a lot of companies and every company is different some companies might want some more rough scenes some company might want some vanilla like a feature or gonzo there's many different things and i i suggest that if you're a new performer you try everything know what you're good at what you're not good at and just focus on what you're good at or get better at what you're not good at you know so for me, it's just like I make I make sure I'm always doing scenes that I know I'm good at, or just like you know, it's like what you do. You, you focus on if you're a three point shooter, you focus on shooting threes. You're not going to be dunking all the time. So oh, that's another thing that's changed in the ABA too. Remember when you could shoot from 15 feet and it was automatic? Now everything's a three pointer. Oh yeah, little kids are just growing up. One yeah, the, uh, there's no know. such thing as a center anymore. Before you used to build from the center and build out your team. Now it's your point guards and your and your your shooting guards. You kind of build from there. So, yeah, your centers need to be able to be a point guard, too, and they need to be able to shoot threes and all that stuff like that. Yeah, they can't be a state-home center. They have to be like more of like a, a power forward or something like that. It's crazy, man, how things evolve yeah. and change. Only ones left is DeMarcus Cousin, kind of, and maybe T- Towns, but both of them are still like kind of like they shoot threes now, too. Yeah. Well, do you remember the first time that you saw wrestling? It, what was it? Was there a particular show you saw? Did you actually go to a live event as, as a kid growing up or, or in high school? What was I the, remember, what I remember drew the you Undertaker to it? and Mankind in the, in the Hell in a Cell match. Oh, my God. That was awesome. And I remember Shane McMahon jumping and the, Jet and the Hardy Boys and Dudley Boys. Put him on the table. Things like that. I remember action figures I used to have and Stone Cold and the Beer, the Rock Bottom, Mankind, the Sock. I remember a lot. Something I tell you, man, we've, we've been to uh, several WrestleManias, and the thing is, for you, this is something I would highly recommend for you, is that when you ever do get a chance, and most likely it's going to head back over to Los Angeles uh, once the Chargers build that new stadium for them, and uh, you know, there's no doubt Chargers, for, the, for yeah. them and the Rams, so there's no doubt they're going to have a, a WrestleMania there. Dude, you got to go to one, because I, I, I kid you not, even if you're a modest wrestling fan, like you saw, and you kind of are not watching anymore, even when you go to it, the atmosphere there, man, like the hairs on your arms stand up, it's that exciting that people are so pumped up for it, that once you go to one, I doubt you that's not going to be the last one you go to. No, yeah, I'm definitely going to have to, because I know John Cena and Randy Orton, a couple ones I used to see when I was younger, are still performing, so I'll definitely have to check that out. Well, Ricky, uh, kind of finishing up here, and I thank you so much for your time. Really, I uh, really appreciate it here. But, um, you know, when uh, you're you're obviously here, you're, you're working, you're in winding, things like that. I mean, you said you obviously, you obviously want to get behind the camera too. Um, is there any chance per se that do you want to stay in the industry completely now, uh, 24-7, or do you want to try to – once you reach a certain point or a certain level of success in your mind, move on to other things besides behind the camera. Is there more mainstream stuff you might be looking to uh, trying to do? I mean, eventually, if the, if the if the opportunity presented itself, I would definitely like to you know even go branch even further off if I could. But I then I really like the industry, so I always want to have my foot in the door no matter what. If there's a way possible, because there's wonderful people in the industry and everybody's open and everybody can be themselves and there's no judgment. So it's it's a wonderful place to be. And you can just be yourself and people accept you for who you are no matter what. Yeah, I mean, so. co- covering the industry myself, man, I've, I've noticed that too where everybody seems to be very happy. I mean, more than anything that I've noticed, I mean, I think in any industry there's always going to be, like I said, competition. People are going to have some bad blood. I mean, there's always going to be some drama in anything you do. It's, you can't get, escape high school sometimes. But at least for the adult film industry, what I've noticed that I've covered is that everybody really does seem to be happy because they're doing something they want to do. Nobody's being forced to perform, knows being forced to do what they're doing, especially the females. So that's always gratifying and kind of inspiring for myself too and people that listen and, and obviously watch our show too, that we've had guests on the show, including yourself, that do this because you love it, you enjoy it, you're, you're happy about it. Um, so I guess that's just more motivation for you too because you feel you're in the room with such more, so many more like-minded people, right? Yeah, yeah. With everybody who like, you're all there for the same reasons, you know. It's mm-hmm. like a community. 
Uh, w- uh, one more, uh, two more things for me, real quick, is that uh, th- that being said, you know, we talked about you know the LeBron James, Michael Jordan, the NBA, the evolution, everything evolves, right? Especially social media too. Back 10, 15 years ago, it wasn't around. So, what about the industry right now? As much as you do enjoy it and embrace it, there are always going to be pros and cons in anything, and always want things to improve. So, right now, what are what's the one thing that you enjoy the most about it in terms of, you know, this is the best thing compared to what you might have thought happened 10 years ago. And what's the one thing you wish would kind of change and evolve a little bit more for the better? I like the, there's a lot more artsy porn, like porn that's like taking like more of a mainstream direction where it's very HD and it's kind of like movie driven and a lot is taken to the shots. Like you might spend like a whole day doing a scene, but it's gonna look really amazing and artistic and kind of like a movie. Because a lot of a lot of companies are getting uh, the budgets to you know they have like sixteen thousand dollar cameras or like some movie movie cameras, and they're using them to make the porn look beautiful. So that's like beautiful porn is like glamour porn is something that wasn't really out there that much. And it's also going back to like also the amateur porn style. So it's a little bit of both. So I, I like both. And what do you think is the one thing that the one or two things you'd wish would improve a little bit more in the industry while you're still in it? Uh, I'd say maybe like something like a union or something mm-hmm. would be nice, you know? Yeah, because you you guys are all independent contractors, right? Yeah. So it'll be it'll be nice to have that because it's a little bit you kind of you kind of on your own, but kind of not at the same time. So yeah, that would be pretty nice. Can you talk a little bit about the business aspect of it, real quick, uh, Ricky? Um, because I've noticed a lot of talent, they, they, you know, just like you have Twitter, Instagram, Tumblr, they have pre-in Snapchats, uh, many vids, I believe, is a website where they put, like, small mini videos you can purchase for, like, 15 bucks, and they're, like, 30 minutes long, whatever. I've noticed yeah. a lot of, a lot of um, performers nowadays, like Kaming, for example, too, like to own their own content. Is that very important for you, too? Because I can only imagine when it comes to, like, you spoke about the budgets some of these production companies have now where it's getting very artsy and stuff like that. Also, that could also be, you know, you're getting a good paycheck for it, but at the same time, not including taxes and fees and things of that nature, you're probably not getting the, the most bulk that you po- you possibly want. So how important is it for you to own your own content so that, you know, when you do receive a paycheck, you're, all those zeros are really going to you rather than going to all the other distributions it needs to go to? Yeah, I mean, there's a new wave of, like, where, like, a lot of performers are having their own content. Like, OnlyFans came out and then, like, a lot of performers start working with each other and just filming their own stuff in, like, an amateur style, and people loved it. So it was just, like, you're making a lot of money and you don't really have to work as much if you have a name because people are like, I want to see this person work. And they look up their OnlyFans and there's like 30 videos of them fucking a girl in their own personal home, their own style, what, what they want. So having your content, it's like, you know, you have a little taste of like having your own residuals. Like, so it's pretty good. And sometimes you make a good amount of money from it, especially like, yeah. you know, in case even if you're not spending a lot of money on like production and stuff like that. It's a quick bring your phone out. If you're having sex with somebody like your friend or your casual like fuck buddy. You can bring a camera out, and boom, you can make at it. You can make like up to like four or five thousand dollars a month. That's that's crazy, man. And again, I think that's just literally the future. I feel of the industry too, where everybody like everybody can have a camera, everybody can cam and stuff like that too. Even if you're an amateur, you can figure it out along the way. I've known some people that have made a tremendous amount of money just camming. And they've never done production. They've never done boy girl scenes. They've just done stuff on their own in their own room. Do you think that's kind of the gateway of, uh, of a new era in terms of the adult film industry? Because, like, yeah, for example... Yeah, I, I think that's where it's, it's going. Think it's kind of like how Netflix is taking over TV and Hulu, where it's like, you know, you have... Yeah, nobody's going to the movie theater anymore, right? Yeah, it's just like things are slowly changing. I think it's also changing in the industry where, like, the performers are having more power and that they can, like, make their own, you know... Your own choices, yes, and that's what I wanted to lead to. Do you feel that way too, that you now as a performer, as an artist, I feel? Because as much as people want to laugh at me, like, oh, you're talking about porn star brain art. It's true. I mean, literally, you guys have to work together to make that fantasy come true for whoever wants to see that genre. So when you're an artist and and you have have that freedom. I mean, that makes you an artist because you're going to watch me or somebody else because they do it a certain way, you know, or else what's the point of having different people? 
not very true. And like I said, it seems like the gateway to uh, a new evolution in, in terms of the adult film industry. Um, and one final one for me, Ricky, uh, with everything you do here, you have all these uh, abilities for people to access you via Twitter, Instagram. If you guys want to uh, see him on Twitter and Instagram, it's all the same thing, one word, at Year of the Ricky. You can check out his Tumblr. Uh, am I saying this correctly? OCRickyJohnson.tumblr.com forward slash? Yeah. Okay, you can also see his OnlyFans, behind-the-scenes stuff at OnlyFans.com forward slash Year of the Ricky, and also his Fan Centro uh, premium Snapchat at FanCentro.com forward slash Ricky Johnson. With all these things that you do and you access or people kind of access to you, how do you manage all that? Do you have somebody that does it for you, or do you basically are you handling all that yourself? Because I'm doing it myself too, and it can get pretty taxing after a while. Yeah, I'm doing it myself, and sometimes I do, like, if I'm working a, a lot and I kind of just don't have the time to, like, focus on some of the social media aspects, but whenever I have free time, I try to. But, yeah, it can definitely be taxing, and then if it gets to a certain point, you might just need, like, a little extra help to have somebody help you out on it. Ricky, will you be going to the events uh, of Exotica in Chicago, Miami, and New Jersey, or do you not know yet? I'll, I'll definitely probably go to Miami and maybe New Jersey, but I won't be able to make Chicago. Okay, sounds good. And obviously, you're going to AVN too, so there's there's no question yeah, about that. You're going to be there. That's where everybody goes. And if you're going to miss out on anything, you can miss out on those. But AVN is the uh, the Oscars. That's, the one, the, that's know, the one you make. The Grammys. That's the one you make, of course. And uh, why wouldn't you? It's a, it's a great place. Went there for the first time last year. Had a great time. Well, if they give me a press pass, man, I've been trying. They, they, they're they playing hardball with me for some reason. If I do get a chance, hopefully I'll see you in Edison, New Jersey, and, and catch up and see how things are going. Ricky, thank you so yeah, much for – yeah, thank you so much for coming in. If you're in New Jersey, though, and there's a wrestling event, you got to go to one. I will drag you down there myself. Like this, you're missing out on this because there's so much more outside WWE, man, that uh, you need to, to, to pay attention to. But, again, you're busy as it is, so I'm not going to even dwell on that. But, yeah, if I, if I see you in Edison, New Jersey, man, you make it there. I would love to kind of catch up and say uh, you know, say what's up and uh, kind of catch up on uh, things that have happened uh, throughout that time. But, Ricky, thank you so much. Uh, anything uh, in the upcoming weeks or uh, in the next couple months that we should be looking forward to? from you uh brazzers house that was a really fun experience uh, it's coming out probably in the fall how how, how is that is that a competition is it like big brother or something like that uh you have 10 girls and and five guys and you put them that's in right the you house. were in brazzers it was just number three right yeah you put them in a giant mansion for like three four days and just you know everybody has sex with each other and there's like challenges it's like real world and like Big Brother and mix and stuff like that. Yeah, but more, cool. more, but more challenges for the females, right? Like, who, who, yeah, who, it's more like girl, like you know, you'll see. It's really cool. You should watch it definitely. No, yeah, yeah, cool. I mean, I, I can only imagine it's three days, but the shooting must have been ridiculous, though, in terms of oh, like, yeah, how, how yeah, long you guys lot, were like sixteen lot, hours really long, probably maybe or there were long, very long days, but it was fun days because it's not so much work because it's like it's like reality shot, shot in a reality format, so you're kind of just being yourself, so like. If you're having sex, then like, they're just like filming it because you're having sex. So what does the winner get usually? Is, is it just like the... Uh, the winner gets $20,000. Oh, wow. Okay. It's not bad. And they just, it's just a quick vote. Who, who's the they, they vote for a top five and there's a finale. And, and, f- and the a, fans a, vote a, for this, orgy. right? Yes, fan voted. Okay, cool. Wow, Ricky, no. man, dude, I have to say, you know, the mere fact that I know I can never be a male performer, so I'm not even going to include that, but I'm so uh, excited and interested in the life that you live, man, because you seem really cool, you re- seem really chill, relaxed, and uh, just enjoying life, and believe me, that's inspirational for me, so if you don't hear it enough, man, at least you hear it from me, and I mean, if I was there in person, I'd shake your hand and say, man, thank you so much for what you do, it's really appreciated by me and everybody that follows the High Spot Podcast, because, you know, we've had guests on the show before that, like I said before, they're doing something they love, they appreciate it, they, they love what what they do and that's inspiring for us and obviously your work ethic man is something that i aspire to be as well and it's just great to be around similar minded people like that too so keep doing what you're doing man it's greatly appreciated by myself i'm sure a lot of other people and uh take care of yourself dude Thank you. I appreciate it. You have a great one. All right. You too, man. Take care. And a special thanks goes out to Ricky Johnson. Really appreciate his time. It was just such a great interview. Getting to know him, guys. If you didn't know certain things about him, you do now. And if you want to follow up on stuff that he's doing, uh, not only recently, but what he has to look forward to, uh, especially in the upcoming months, at the end of the year, before you know it, AVN will be just right around the corner. You guys can follow him on Twitter, Instagram, at Year of the Ricky. You can also follow him on Tumblr, OnlyFans, and Premium Snapchat if you guys want to find out all that is Ricky Johnson. So, guys, thank you so much for listening to this episode. Really appreciate all the support you give us. I'll make sure you follow the High Spot Podcast on Twitter, Instagram, po- uh, Snapchat. I was going to say Poppy. You can listen to it on Poppy and SoundCloud. Tune in, Google Play as well. Um, 
just so follow us on High Spot Podcast, and you'll see all the shenanigans the Jersey Red Crew is always a part of. So, guys, thank you so much for listening to this episode. And just remember, for the High Spot Podcast, Adventures of the Trendsetter, I do this for one reason and one reason only. I do this for you, the crew.